the medicinal plants in Maya medicine are always collected with the herb collector's prayer. Yo soy quien doy gracias a esta planta. Pido a Dios que me ayuda. También pido un favor a los mayas que ayuda también. Le doy gracias al espíritu de esta planta. Y pido que me ayude a hacer una buena medicina. Dios Padre, Dios Hijo, Dios Espíritu Santo. Yo doy gracias al espíritu de esta planta. Y pido que me ayude a hacer una buena medicina. En nombre de Dios Padre, Dios Hijo, Dios Espíritu Santo. Amén. Doy gracias al espíritu de Ashkenan. Pido que me ayude a hacer una buena medicina para los granitos de la gente. En nombre de Dios Padre y Dios Hijo, Dios Espíritu Santo. Amén. Gracias al Espíritu de tres puntos y tengo la fe en todo mi corazón. Me planto de esta oración, este planta que me ayuda a hacer una buena medicina para la gente, para sus granos y sus heridas. Dios Padre, Dios Hijo, Dios Espíritu Santo. Amén. Santa, gracias al Espíritu de esta planta, tengo la fe que todo mi corazón y todo el poder de esta oración. Y esta planta para que me ayude a hacer una buena medicina para la gente. Doy gracias al Espíritu de Obel. Tengo la fe con todo mi corazón en lo cual poder de esta oración y este plato para ayudarme con las enfermedades de la gente. Dios Padre, Dios Hijo, Dios Espíritu Santo. Amén. Y Dios Padre, Dios Hijo, Dios Espíritu Santo. Amén. Y gracias al Espíritu. The most common way of consuming herbal teas in the household is either by infusion or decoction. In order to make an infusion, you have fresh plant material, usually would be leaves and flowers and stems. Those require to be infused in hot water or steeped. So this little teapot, for instance, holds three cups. So if we were to make a pot of mint tea infusion with three cups, we would take our fresh mint plant material and you break it up. We need generally about one third cup of fresh plant material per cup of water. So in this case, because we're making three cups of peppermint tea, we need one cup of fresh peppermint. And we prefer to break it with our hands so that the steel from the knife doesn't affect the essential oils or medicinal principles of the plant. So whenever possible, Use your hands for breaking them up. So here we have one cup of fresh peppermint tea. We pour that into a teapot, and then you will fill that. With hot boiling water. To the top. And you let it sit. It's called steeping. That's how you make an infusion. Generally, the steeping would be about 15 minutes. Some prefer 10. 10 to 15 minutes would be fine. Then you strain, sweeten if desired, and drink. The other type of herbal tea would be called a decoction. Decoction means that you actually boil the materials in the water. Generally, we boil for about 10 minutes. Now, for boiling decoctions, we would say that would be for uh, roots, and barks, seeds, and pieces of heavy stems that would be heavy plant parts as opposed to soft leaves and flowers. So here we have again a three cup teapot and for that we need about a tablespoon per cup 
For this decoction, we're making a blood tonic. This is a combination of the Mexican wild yam and the China root. So because we have a three cup pot of tea, we will have three tablespoons. One, two, three tablespoons of dry plant material. And then you will fill with water. Put on to boil for a period of 10 minutes. And still it's a good idea after you boil for 10 minutes to allow it to steep for another 10 minutes and then strain it off. And after 10 minutes, you would then strain your infusion of peppermint tea. It makes a lovely tasting tea that would be nice for children with tummy ache, for baby colic, for indigestion of adults, and just for a lovely beverage household tea. Always nice to have a little peppermint patch if you can grow it in your garden. And there you are, peppermint tea. Mmm, nice. Sometimes it's easier and more efficient to take herbal remedies in tinctures as opposed to teas. Generally, we think that a cup of tea equals about a teaspoon of herbal tincture in alcohol. And sometimes there are principles or chemicals inside of plants that are more efficiently extracted from the plant material in alcohol than in water. So we're going to make two types of herbal tinctures. The first one is from fresh plant material, and the second would be from dry plant material. The first one we'll make is a tincture of jackass bitters or Neuralena lobata, a common plant all around Central America, which is very useful for parasitic conditions, whether it be intestinal parasites or ringworm, fungus. So the first thing we do is take, decide on the size of jar that you would like to make your tincture to be. This is just a little bit more than a pint and less than a quart. So we take the fresh tincture, again, breaking it with our hands, I'm sorry, the fresh plant, breaking it with our hands, put it into the jar until the jar is loosely filled. That means that you don't stuff it down with your fingers, but you fill it loosely with the fresh plant material. And that could really be any other type of leaf or flower or stem which you would like to make a herbal tincture for therapeutic purposes. In this case, we chose jackass bitters. It's very difficult to drink cups and cups of jackass bitters, as the Creole people say. It's so bitter, you have to be one jackass for drink it. So you can much more easily take a teaspoon than a cup. So now we have our jar loosely filled with fresh plant material. Now you have a choice. You can choose either rum. Every Caribbean country makes their own rum, as far as I know, and vodka. Vodka is another choice. Today, we're going to use the vodka. So you take the vodka and you fill all of the empty spaces inside the jar with the vodka. And right to the top. And it's very important that the plant material is well covered with the alcohol. And then you seal it properly. And this is meant to sit for four to six weeks. It's, that's important so that there's enough time for the active principles of the plant to be extracted by the alcohol. And it is very important that you label the product. You'll think that you'll never forget what's in there. Believe me, you'll forget. So we will label this jackass bitters tincture. And then you put the date. The date is very important so that you can remember what day you started your four to six weeks steeping in alcohol. And then you place the label on the jar and put it in a cool, dark place away from sunlight and every day or every other day, you should give it a shake. Agitate it, just like that, a few times, and then set it aside again. There you have a Jackass Bitters fresh tincture. In four to six weeks, you can start dosing. 
with it. Generally, we recommend a teaspoon per day, three times a day, depending on what ailment you are addressing. After four or six weeks, then, of course, you need to strain off your Jack S. Bitters tincture. You strain it through a sieve, through a strainer. You see we get a nice emerald green alcohol tincture out of that. And this will last almost indefinitely. Generally, we think about seven years for an alcohol tincture. It may even be more, but after seven years, hopefully you will have consumed it. Again, you just want to store this in a cool, dry place. Some place like the pantry is fine. A kitchen cabinet is all right. But we prefer that you not keep it over the refrigerator because of the heat and the electricity. And then again, you have to label it. Now you will label just jackass bitters tincture. And again, place the date. Always remember to put in the date. Very important so that you know how long you have been storing this product. This is very useful alcoholic tincture for intestinal parasites, for ringworm, conditions like candida, even for uh, fungus on the skin. You could take it topically, meaning you would put it over the skin fungus. There you go. Jack has bitters tincture. Very useful, very therapeutic and medicinal. At some times you will want to or need to make a alcohol tincture with dry plant materials. For instance, sometimes you harvest Jack has bitters and you may not see it again fresh for any number of months. So you have harvested and dried it and now you need to make a tincture. Also, if you're using vines and roots and barks that have been chopped and dried, then you would make a dry tincture with those. So if we have a glass jar that is a pint, a pint is 16 ounces. For each cup in your jar, you need one third cup of dry plant material. So because we have two cups in this pint, we then need two thirds cup of dry jackass bitters. This is dried jackass bitters, rather powdered because that's what happens to it when it gets dry. So we have, this is a third cup measure. Fill that. There is one third, and this would be two thirds. So you end up pretty much with a one third filled glass container. And then you pour the alcohol. Again, in this case, we're going to use the vodka. You pour the alcohol over that until the jar is filled and all the dry plant material is well covered. And right to the top, make sure that all the plant material is well covered. And we will push it down a little bit, mix it up. And the same, you will treat this the very same way you would a fresh plant tincture. You put it away in a cool, dry place. Store it that way for about four to six weeks. Be sure that you label it and shake it occasionally. Once a day, once every other day is fine. And there you have it. Just needs its label. Okay, whether you're making a wet or a dry tincture, you still need to strain it into a nice clean container. Fill to the top. Make sure that you have it labeled. That's very important because all of these tinctures look exactly alike almost once they are completed. So that you don't get confused and you don't mistake one tincture for another, which of course would be rather dangerous. You have a label and a date. So there you have a tincture of dry jackass bitters. A wonderful thing to have in your home kitchen medicine cabinet is a good cough syrup. The cough syrup that we're going to make today is an easy formula. 
we have a combination of three different plants. I have the avocado leaf, I have the Spanish thyme leaf, and oregano. The avocado leaf acts as the expectorant. The oregano leaf acts as an antibacterial should there be an infection in the mucus that comes up from the lungs. And then the thyme is a combination of expectorant, a soother for the passages of the lungs and the throat, and also helps as an antibacterial agent because of the thymol and the oregano. So we have a combination of avocado leaf, thyme, and oregano. And we're going to make, first of all, a two cups of water, and then we need for two cups of water, one cup of fresh broken plant material. So we take the avocado leaf, break them up into small pieces, take two or three of the thyme leaves so that you get more or less equal proportions. And then the oregano, again breaking them up nicely. The reason we break them is to open the cellular structure of the plant so that their active principles, the essential oils, the medicinal part of the plants gets into the water and the cough syrup. So now we have probably about a cup, but let's see how it looks. I have one cup measure to fill with this fresh plant material, avocado, thyme, and oregano. We need a little more. So we take a bit more of each, oregano, avocado leaf. Many of you know avocado leaf for cough. It works very well. It's probably an ancient remedy. And people who live in other countries would be able to use it because avocado grows in many different places around the world. So there we are now. Our cup of fresh plant material goes into a pot. And then you will add two cups of water. And that you will boil for about 20 minutes under a very nice low flame. Longer than we would make for a fresh plant uh, infusion because this is a different product. It's a cough syrup and we need it to be a little bit stronger and more concentrate. So we put this on the stove and boil under a very low heat covered for about 20 minutes. It's important that you cover this decoction that will become a cough syrup because we don't want the essential oils to be lost in the vapor or the steam. That's why they're called volatile oils. After having boiled your cough syrup for about 20 minutes, of course, then quite a bit of it has boiled off, so we now have a concentrate of those plants, and let's see how much we're left with. Good, we're left with almost exactly one cup of herbal decoction, which we are going to turn into a cough syrup by the following method. You will place your cough syrup decoction right into a nice clean jar. So we have one cup of tea, and we take an equal portion of brown sugar. That's how you make a syrup. That's why it's called syrup. It's quite thick with sugar. So we measure out one cup of brown sugar. And there are some herbalists who like to put the sugar right into the decoction. That's another way. I prefer to do it this way. I feel like you have a little better control of the equal amounts of tea to sugar. So you pour in the equal amount. This also helps to preserve the cough syrup. And with the spoon, give it a stir. With some of the brown sugar, you may have to heat it again to get that sugar to melt properly. Now after that, I add just a quarter teaspoon of eucalyptus oil. That gives it a nice effect of really warming and loosening the lungs and the mucus. It's very comforting to a person with the cough, and it makes it taste more like a cough syrup. So just a quarter of a teaspoon, see it's very little bit, several drops of eucalyptus oil. And because we have the sweetened tea, it may ferment if you don't have refrigeration. So we're going to put a tablespoon, just a tablespoon of rum 
into the cough syrup. That will prevent fermentation and it also acts as a little bit of a sedative. It also helps to warm the lungs and the chest. It makes a person feel comforted and relaxed. There's your cough syrup. You give it a little shake. And I think you'll be quite pleasantly surprised how lovely and delicious this tastes. In fact, my children always came back for more when they didn't even have a cough. So let's see how it is. Let's give it a taste. Very nice. I think it's quite therapeutic, lovely. You can already feel the warmth down the throat and into the chest. It's a nice cough syrup, and I hope that you'll use it and that your family will feel much better during those winter months. All right, I think another essential herbal product for the household medicine cabinet is a good skin salve. This salve that we're going to make today is a combination of three different fresh plants. We have Ashkenan, or sometimes called Pali Redhead, Hamelia patens. It's also called in Spanish Sana Lo Todo, which means cure everything. It's primarily used for skin conditions, rashes, sores, wounds, and our gumbo limbo, Bursera simaruba. Gumbo limbo is a famous tree that is used for any type of red swelling or rashy skin condition, especially if you come in contact with poison wood, poison oak, or poison ivy. And Jack S. Bitters, again, is another heal-all for the skin. Primarily, it's used as a means of knitting flesh back together again, very much like comfrey in the United States. And it's a powerful antibacterial agent to prevent infections on the skin. So I think the three of these together make a very dynamic and useful for general purpose salve. In order to make a salve, you need an oil base. We could use olive oil, some people use vegetable oil, some people use vegetable shortening. So here we're going to use olive oil. We're going to start with a cup. So we measure off one cup of pure olive oil. It makes a lovely salve. Olive oil itself is very soothing to the skin. It's even mentioned in the Bible as a demulsant for skin. So we pour the olive oil into the pot and then we break up our plant material equal portions, more or less, of each, so that we have, again, a cup of fresh plant material. That means that if you have one cup of oil, it requires one cup of broken fresh plant material. If you're going to make more salve, say you want to make a quart of salve, then you would have a quart of your oil or shortening, then you would have one quart equal portions of your fresh plant material. So we break up these gumbo limbo leaves, put them, and there we have a cup. You see? Nice full cup of the fresh plant material. And we put that into the oil. We'll put it on the stove over a very low heat. It's important now that a salve does not boil. If you boil a salve in oil, you're frying the plant materials. And then the cell walls close. They shut down, and you won't be able to efficiently extract the medicinal properties of each of the plants into your salve. So we'll put this on the stove and leave it at a very low simmering heat so that what we do is we heat it and shut it off. Bring it up to a, with a simmer to it barely, you can see it begin to boil, and then shut it off. More or less we do that about every 30 to 45 minutes throughout the day. So that would take about an eight hour process. Or an alternative is to put it in the oven at about 100 degrees overnight and just let it sit and then pour it off in the morning. And as you'll see, it takes on a very lovely, rich, green, jade-like color when it's completed. So we'll put it on the stove now. All right, once your salve has steeped overnight or you've turned it on and off for a period of about eight hours, then you need some beeswax to make it salve. Otherwise, it's just an oil infusion of medicinal plants. So here's a lovely piece of fresh beeswax. And you use a regular kitchen grater and grate the wax so that it breaks into smaller pieces. Now we have one cup of salve, and we need one quarter cup of beeswax. So we will add the beeswax to the salve. Give it time to melt. 
melts very quickly. Yeah, I just want to make sure we're getting everything pretty well melted now. Okay. Now you need to work rather quickly and pour off your salve into your bottle. Have it ready because the wax actually will begin to then you strain the oil infused herbs and you see what a lovely green rather jade like color we come up with. You'll be very pleased with the effects of this salve especially for young children who have had mosquito bites and sometimes they scratch them they get infected for minor cuts that tend to be coming be getting infected skin rashes, even sunburn this would be excellent for. So good all-purpose salve with a lot of different qualities and uses. And you make sure you get all of that lovely infused oil out. And there you have it. After you have melted the beeswax and added it to the oil and the herbs, then you want to pour it off into a nice, clear, and clean container. And look what a beauty. Isn't that lovely? Nice green salve. Make sure that you cover it properly. And again, as always, label and store away. And as always, remember to label it and store it away in a cool, dry place. Be sure to use it regularly. You're going to love it. It's always good to have a nice natural skin lotion that you could use for temporary eruptions, pimples, mild cases of acne, or even irritations like uh, summer skin rash, heat rash, or minor sunburn. So what we're going to do now is make a lovely skin lotion from roses and hibiscus. Both of them are very healing and soothing to the skin. Hibiscus is in the same family as okra. It's one of the mallows, like you think of maybe like marshmallow. So it's very soothing. It has a mucilaginous nature to its petal. And that mucilage translates as soothing or demulsant to the skin. So we break up the two hibiscus flowers, just the petals, and then the roses, breaking those up into their little petals just the flower itself. We don't need the leaves or the stem. Then we're going to pour a cup of water. This is a cup. Into the bowl. It's a very simple process of just breaking, mashing, and squeezing. No boiling preparation or cooking because really we want the freshest part even the vitamins, both of these plants, the rose and the hibiscus, have vitamins in them as well. Sometimes we lose the vitamins in cooking. And before long, we actually get a really nice rose-colored, slippery, soothing lotion out of this. It actually happens very quickly. And in a short time, you'll be able to see the transformation of the rather crimson-colored water. And you just keep squeezing a few minutes. Okay, are we ready? That's quite enough. That's probably three to five minutes of squeezing and mashing is enough. And we strain it. And you see that we are left with a very, very lovely colored. And you see the thickness now that has been put into the water, actually, by the mucilage in the hibiscus. If you were to refrigerate this, it probably would last, I would think, maybe seven to 10 days. Unrefrigerated, it's bound to ferment in about 24 hours. But still, if you have hibiscus and roses in your garden, 
you could make a fresh skin lotion every day. Dip in and use it just like that on your face or for the baby's diaper rash. Often babies get heat rash right in here in the little creases of the neck. Just pat this in there, especially for teenagers with problem skin. Okay, one of the regular jobs I performed during my 12 years as the apprentice to Don Eligio Panti of San Antonio in Belize was to prepare his wound powder. Wound powder is not something that's commonly used in other parts of the world, but in Central America and especially in Don Eligio's clinic, it was a regular part of his therapy. He often had patients with very severe wounds, especially deep skin ulcers, sometimes from diabetes. Diabetic skin ulcers can be very, very difficult to heal. And Don Eligio always used a wound powder for those very deep sores and wounds. Today we're going to make that same wound powder that Don Eligio lives so, loves so much with Jack as bitters and again the poly redhead. These two plants in combination make the best wound powder that I know of. And Don Eligio always said that we have to roast these leaves until they actually begin to burn so that we almost reduce them to an ash. And we know from biochemistry that when plants are reduced to ash, a nearly burning process, that a lot of their minerals, which are the active principles of the plants in some cases, are then released in the ash and much more available to the human body, especially when applied over the skin. So what we're going to do is take a dry frying pan, place the fresh leaves in the pan, put it over the stove, and with a wooden spoon, continually stir and stir over the heat of the stove, and again, at about a moderate, neither low nor high flame. You don't want them to burst into flames, you just want them to gradually and slowly roast and toast until the dry plant material begins to smoke, and it looks as though you've almost gone too far. That's the right point. So that the plants are actually almost turned to ash, and that's very important. It's not just a roasting process that makes a wound powder, but almost reducing the plants to ash. So we'll place it on the stove, and it's about maybe 20 minutes is usually how long it takes to roast these fresh plants to the point of nearly burning. So after about 20 minutes, this is what we end up with, nice, crispy plant material. That's both the jackass bitters and the ashkanan. And you see how nicely roasted and how easily it begins to powder. And then your next process is to put it through a sieve, a strainer, something like this. And we shake it and allow just the finest powder to come through. It's very important in a wound powder that you don't have any of these little tiny bits and pieces of stem in there because that would be painful to a person with a deep skin ulcer. So sometimes we have to do this twice. And that's what we're going to do right now. We're going to strain this through again to eliminate all of those bits and pieces of stem because the stem turns out to be something like a needle on a person's flesh when it has a sore, an ulcer, or an infection. And there we have it. And there we have it. And you can see that it makes a very lovely and very dark. And you notice how dark that is and how the plants seem to be almost, almost reduced to ash. You see that? Now, if we were to apply this over a wound, Don Eligio would first apply some oil. It could be castor oil or it might be olive oil. And then the wound powder is sprinkled, just like that, on top of it. And the oil holds it. And then that would be washed again and replace the wound powder twice a day, about every 12 hours. Herbal bathing is an integral part of Maya medicine. In Don Eligio's clinic in San Antonio, nearly every patient who came to see him for whatever ailment received a series of herbal baths. Don Eligio taught me more than 100 different plants that could be used for herbal bathing. Sometimes the traditional healer may use four different plants. 
sometimes seven, sometimes nine. The number of plants that we use in a herbal bath are also important. Each traditional healer seems to settle on a number that resonates with them. Don Eligio always chose four or nine, and that's pretty much what I have stayed with over the years as well. Generally four and sometimes nine plants. Today, we're making a herbal bath with basil, also known as holy basil, um, albahacar in Spanish, and marigold in Spanish is flor de muerto, also considered to be a sacred plant of the Maya, and hibiscus, hibiscus for the soothing nature of the skin. Again, for the same reason we put it in the skin lotion. So we have three flowers of hibiscus, and we're going to take four leaves of the Life Everlasting or Siempre Viva. All of these plants together are soothing to the nerves, soothing to the skin, and especially would be wonderful in a herbal bath for a child or a baby. So we have a bowl containing all four fresh plants, and we fill it with water. Now depending on the size of your basin, of course, it would probably be larger than this if you are actually making a herbal bath at home. So say you might have a bucket. You would fill the bucket with water and you would take a, about equal portions of your plant material. You might then choose nine leaves of life everlasting. You might take nine flowers of hibiscus and about the same amount of basil and marigold that you see here. And much like we did the skin lotion with roses and hibiscus, it's a very simple process of mashing and squeezing to make a herbal bath. Of course, we're very fortunate to live in the tropics, like Belize, where we have warm weather and fresh plants all year long. If you had to make a, a herbal bath and you didn't have fresh plant material, you could then pour hot water over dry plants. And that's a really good reason to dry, your, to dry the uh, marigolds and also to dry the basil. Not many people would think about drying marigolds for medicine, but they make wonderful baths. Very aromatic. As I say, it's very wonderful for the, for the nerves, for people who don't sleep well, those with nervous conditions, people with skin irritations, and all children and all babies in Don Eligio's clinic, no matter what the ailment, received a series of herbal baths, usually three or four baths, and he would instruct the mother to do exactly this. If she didn't have a little garden where she could get marigold, basil, hibiscus, and life everlasting, he might give her a bag full of fresh plant material and instruct her to do this very thing. And you see again how lovely and rich the color becomes, and its aroma is delightful. I think the aroma itself is quite soothing and comforting. So there you have it, nothing more than that. Some people like to put it in the sunlight for perhaps an hour so that all of the essential oils, the minerals from the plants have an opportunity to steep in the sun. Not necessary. Sometimes you have to have a herbal bath right now. So now we would strain it. If you were going to take it into the shower, of course you wouldn't want to get all of that rough plant material into the shower. Some people might bathe outside then you wouldn't have to strain it. And you would take a bowl or a cup and pour it over yourself like this. Pouring is actually better, we believe, than soaking in the bathtub. If it's a baby, you could fill the baby's bath with the herbal bath water. Make sure that you stay with the baby. Watch it so that it doesn't slip, of course, and fall into the water. And then you would take a cup again and pour this water over the baby's head over the baby's back. Babies enjoy it. They have a nice time playing with the flowers, picking up the leaves. Actually, all of these plants are food and medicine. So nothing would be harmful if the baby should put anything into its mouth. So let's strain it and see what a very pretty natural brew we have. And the leftover plant material 
has a use all of its own. You can take that and actually use it as a poultice for irritated skin. It's very soothing. You could squeeze out directly onto the skin. And there you have it, a herbal bath ready to go. There you have it. Isn't that delightful? Lovely, aromatic, and soothing. Probably one of the most common household ailments that we have to deal with are bruises, sprains, and strains from falling or tripling, especially with young children. One of the very best leaves used to alleviate the pain, the stiffness of sprains and strains and swelling is this leaf, obel, sometimes called cow foot, and its Latin name is piper or atium. It's very common, easy to find. There's really no other leaf that's as big as that, looks like that, and has that same rather licorice-like aroma. So what we're going to do, assume that we had a sprained wrist. You take a small glass or jar, turn the leaf over, and gently roll. You hear the cells cracking? What we're doing is actually exposing the cells of the leaf and making the active principle or the essential oil, which is called piperol, available and easily transmuted through the skin. And turn the other side. I think you can even begin to see some of the essential oil rising up to the surface. You can't, but I can certainly smell it. A few times back and forth until you hear that that crackling sound is lessening. That's quite enough. We remove that little tough part. Now say we had a sprained wrist. You would place the leaf with the top side down and then just wrap it. Lay this here, bring this around, and then generally we would wrap that up with a cloth to keep it in place. You place it over the area where there has been a strain or a sprain. Take a cloth, hold it in place with the cloth. You could right there apply a little safety pin. And there you have it, an obel poultice for strains or sprains. From this leaf, we're going to make a very useful little skin poultice. This is a common decorative leaf. We call it the snake plant. Other people call it mother-in-law's tongue because it's long and sharp. Its Latin name is Sansevieria. The traditional use is to apply this to the stings and bites of scorpions or bees, hornets, wasps, even snakes. That's one of the reasons it's called snake plant. So what we do is remove this much between your thumb and forefinger of the very tip of the plant. So if we measure from the tip, from forefinger to thumb, the instructions are to cut off that much. That we remove. Apparently, that doesn't have the same amount of medicinal principles in it as the rest of the plant. And we take a small portion, of course, depending on the size of the wound or the bite that we're treating. Let's say we take just a few inches here. And then the preparation, you start with a stone by just pounding the leaf, pounding and breaking up the little bits of cells inside. Then we add just a little pinch of salt. Now the traditional healers say that the salt actually brings out the active principle of the plant. Now you can really hear it working. 
You just break that up. The juices are beginning to come out of the plant. This is very useful, sometimes even after people have been treated for snake bite. There is a little bit of an encapsulation under the skin where the venom entered that still remains and is very sore, tender, and sometimes numb for many months. When we apply this leaf, mashed with a little bit of salt, say it were on the finger, we would take this, lay it around the finger, close it up, and then wrap it with the cloth. And the person leaves that on all day long. They could change it once in the morning and once in the evening. I saw a fellow come to me with a snake bite on his finger. He had been treated at the hospital with snake venom, but still in his finger was a little bump. And under that bump, it was very sore, and part of his finger was numb. After applying this leaf to that old snake bite, after about three days, again, of changing it twice a day, that little bump opened up in a long black fluid, kind of like black syrup, came running out of that old snake bite. And we think that was probably the last remnants of the snake bite venom. So there you have it, snake plant, Sansevieria, mother-in-law's tongue, something really useful to know how to use at home. There are many foods in your kitchen that can be used as medicine. The potato is one of them. Now, when we grate the potato, it's very useful for eye conditions. It might be pink eye, and I've had excellent results with using a fresh, raw, grated potato on an eye that maybe was inflamed, and especially where there is an object embedded in the eye that is very difficult to remove. So you just need a very small amount, just a little bit more than a tablespoon of fresh, raw, grated potato, a piece of clean cloth, and you place the potato on the cloth on a single layer so that the grated potato is easy to get to the eye. And we fold it over, somewhat like making a pocket. Fold it again so that it stays inside. Fold it this way. That way. Then you place it. There's the potato. You can already see the liquid starting to move through the cloth. You place that little poultice right over the eye and have the person lie down and rest for a while. And I saw the most amazing event once using this. There was a little boy who had a fight with another little boy. And the little boy threw a whole handful of dirt into his friend's eye. And he came home crying and screaming with this big pile of dirt in his eye. We applied a potato poultice. We set him to lay down for about 15 minutes. And as he got up, this big, long stream of mud came pouring out of his eye. And all the mud came out with the potato. So there you are, a nice, easy-to-make potato poultice for eye irritations, pink eye, or objects embedded in the eye. Do it. You'll be surprised how well it works. Unfortunately, headaches are very common in the tropics because of the exposure of heat on the top of our heads. But because they're so common, traditional healers have all settled on some very wonderful different treatments for headaches. One of the most common is a cloth poultice made from hibiscus flowers and gumbo limbo leaves. The traditional healers say that these two plants, both the hibiscus and the gumbo limbo, actually have the effect of drawing some of the heat out of the forehead and alleviating the headache. And I've seen it work really well. It's very soothing, very easy to prepare. You break off the leaves from the gumbo limbo branch and separate the flowers, place them into a small bowl. Then we add just enough water to moisten. Nothing, not even a quarter of a cup, perhaps an eighth of a cup of water, just enough to give us something to moisten these plants. And then we begin the same process of squeezing and mashing. We want to break up the leaf of the gumbo limbo and the flower of the hibiscus until you get something that is rather uniformly Mash. Sometimes I have to break them like I'm going to do right now to get them easier 
mashed up together. Okay. Okay. All right, just a tiny bit of water, just enough to moisten the plants. You don't want too much water, that's important. Just now you see we're getting a nice bolus, a nice mash. And that's quite enough until it looks just about like that. See? You can see the little bits of flowers, all the broken up leaves. And we'll separate that out into what would about be the length of a person's forehead, just about the length of the palm of your hand. And you place that onto a clean cloth. You lay the poultice right on one piece, one layer of the cloth. And fold this way, fold that way so that it's contained within. And then I like my piece of cloth to be almost a yard long so that you don't make the mistake of making it too short and then you can't tie it. And if you turn it over, you can already see how the plant juices are beginning to exude right into the cloth. And that part, that is what you lay up against the forehead, just like that. Bring it back, tie it, give it a twist. These ends you can fold in. And the person wears this for about 20 to 30 minutes. Generally, in about 10 minutes time, they start feeling tremendous relief from the headache. And occasionally, I've even seen this part look like it came off cooked, all dry. You see how wet and moist it is now. It really does draw the heat out of the forehead. It works well, and generally you can expect it's going to relieve the headache in somewhere between 15 to 30 minutes. There you have it, a lovely poultice of hibiscus and gumbo limbo for headaches, especially those due to sun exposure. Whether in children or adults, earaches are very painful, very difficult to treat sometimes as well. There's a common little garden leaf called Spanish thyme. Spanish thyme contains an essential oil known as thyme oil, which has been used for many years in scientific research as an antibacterial agent. So first we have to heat the leaf. You could either heat it on a stove, you could use a lighter, a match. What we're trying to do is break the cells of the plant by heating it. And it's also very soothing and part of the therapy to put these drops that are warmed right into the ear as opposed to just a cold plant juice. All right, so after that, you'll see that you'll be able to get quite a bit of juice out of this leaf. Make sure it's not too hot so that you don't burn the person. And we roll the leaf. And let's see if we can get our juice. Thank <laughs> you. 